go ahead and uh, get started. Um, welcome everyone to the Inform Collaborative. Uh, as you as you know, um, we have a special Friday edition today. Um, the collaborative was conceived as a clearinghouse of information of issues of common cause for professional associations, uh, and um, we're we're grateful today to have uh, uh, two guest speakers uh, to be speaking on the topic of uh, professional societies and the uh, and the new normal and the, the perspective from the, the CIO. And uh, I'm pleased today to have um, uh, Dino Damalis, uh, who is the uh, Chief Operating Officer for the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, um, a uh, former Marine uh, who maintains that Marine-like attitude in his daily operations, a, a technology junkie, and, um, uh, and obviously and someone who is just all in all hyper-competitive. Uh, Dino has been at the forefront front of integrating technology and strategy into his current role at AAOS and in his prior role we worked together uh, when he was CIO for the American College of Cardiology. Uh, thanks Dino for being here. Yeah, and then uh, Ron Moen is also with us uh, as CIO of CHEST. Uh, Ron and his team serve at the intersection of people, process, and technology in the premier innovative organization mm. for CHEST medicine professionals around the world. Uh, CHEST uh, uh, constituents and staff are champions for prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of diseases of the lungs. And Ron encourages new ideas, creative solutions, and collaborative approaches. And um, you know, Ron and his team and his membership have been at the very center of the uh, the COVID nineteen response. And uh, we're incredibly grateful for the work that they're doing uh, on the front lines of um, uh, of this uh, pandemic. So. Uh, uh, so great. Thanks guys for being with us today. Let's go ahead and get started and and I'd like to start by asking and uh, Dino I'll start with you if I may, you know, the, the topic, the title is um, the new normal for professional associations, especially the view from from the CIO chair. So let me just test and see if, if you agree that our association is about to emerge into a, a new normal. Or do you think we're just going to reset and res resume business as usual uh, once uh, we're all back, fully back at work in a more traditional environment? Well, uh, thanks, Kevin. Thanks for having me on. Uh, new normal. I got to tell you, if, if normal is the conformance of standards or general expectations, then no. I think what we're seeing are, are reactions and adaptations to really extreme environmental impacts. We're, we've gone from primarily working in an office environment to overnight just being completely virtual. I don't think the new normal is going to strike till well after this pandemic is over. I think it's going to be after this thing is, it, it has gone by, after we've kind of resumed some level of operations uh, back in the office. And I think you'll start to see the dust settle. I, I think you'll start to see uh, that there won't be quite the need to have everybody in the office. I think you'll see a, a, a better utilization of technology. Um, there will be new norms for technology, workplace practices, working style, but I think it's a little further off than we think. Um, it's definitely, I don't think it's going back to 2019. I mean, just looking at uh, what we're considering now in terms of office space utilization, the types of talent that we want to start bringing in after this, or even during this, you know, folks that can effectively manage teams remotely. Uh, these are all things that are coming up and, and I, I'm actually kind of worried we own our building. Uh, so I, I'm not, I'm not sure what, what office space utilization is going to look like uh, and what kind of liability we'll be carrying there. So not yeah, yet, thanks, Dino. but it's coming. Uh, let me remind folks that there's also a chat feature that's available as part of this. And if you have questions, we'll make time at the end, certainly, but feel free to use the chat function if you want to, um, make comments and, and uh, pose questions as we go on. So Ron, let me, let me turn to you. Uh, same question. Um, are we, are we going to reset into a new normal uh, or is it the business as usual when we get back and, uh, and off we go? Yeah. First of all, uh, thank you for saying that our constituents are at the center of the response to the pandemic. A lot of people say, yeah, those chess constituents are at the center of the pandemic, like we were the source and the cause. So uh, kudos to you for your word choices, Kevin. Our team, uh, our chess constituents are uh, leading the response. Uh, so thank you. Um, 
Yeah, I think I think we already are in a new normal. I don't. I don't. I think the play. You know, to Dino's words, uh, we're not going back to 2019. Uh, Chest uh, probably like AOS um, on the 11th or 12th of March uh, went to virtual. Uh, we did it almost cold turkey. Fortunately, we were ready just because of the way we work. Uh, we were ready to go uh, remote. You know, we still do print checks, and someone has to come in and sign them. So, you know, we're not completely virtual, but um, yeah, we're not going back to 2019 anytime soon. We, we also own our building, Dino, and we have, uh, like you have a simulation center at AOS, we have a simulation center here at Chest. We have six intensive care units with simulated patients. So we do look forward to the day when we can gather in an ICU suite and train healthcare professionals in physical simulation. Uh, but the new normal of 110 staff people sitting on the B side of the building, uh, yeah, we already are at a new normal, and I don't think we're going back to 2019. Thanks, Ron. Ron, just to uh, to stay with you for a moment, what do you think have been the most profound adjustments that professional associations have had to make uh, during this this interval? Yeah. You know, I think uh, for chess, from our own experiences. Uh, the adjustment was really that acceleration to virtual. I mean, we've been doing, uh, we've been dabbling in uh, virtual reality and augmented reality for our healthcare professional education for at least three years. Um, a lot of it's been slow and a lot of it's been proof of concept and a lot of it's been pilot. So, you know, the really the acceleration and the doubling down of doing that now and not really wondering if we're going to do it, but how quickly we can do it and how profitably we can do it. Uh, that's one of the biggest adjustments we've made. And from what I can read and see, you know, we're not the only association doing that. So I, I don't, uh, I don't want to speak on behalf of, of Reggie Henry and the rest of the ASA CIO community, but you know, we're not the only ones who are, um, you know, who are there. Great, thanks, Ron. Do you know, uh, let me ask you the same question. What do you think have been the most profound uh, adjustments that professional associations have had to make in the, in the face of the pandemic? You know, um, I think there's a, there's a bunch of things that they've actually had to change. So, uh, you know, I've, I've spoken with a lot of uh, other uh, association professionals and they're in different, uh, different sizes, different states, uh, different areas, different specialties. And I think one of the things that's evident is that, you know, the, 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 the decision time, decisions need to be made faster than the speed of organizing a committee call, right? And, and, and staff need to kind of step in there and kind of take more ownership over, over uh, kind of planning and moving us along. The, the, the adjustment from going to uh, planning uh, to go all virtual happened almost overnight. I mean, we were, we were from uh, let's test it out just in case things get worse to that test period being the day that we went right to virtual. Um, I also think that from a financial perspective, uh, you know, speaking with a lot of other colleagues, you know, a lot of folks felt that uh, being viable was breaking even every year. And I think what we realize now is that breaking even is not enough. We, you know, from a, from a we, we associations are full on businesses. They have to generate revenue. They have to do that to kind of build reserves. They have to do that to kind of create a buffer in case things go sideways, just like this year. So if you were living uh, from, from uh, break even, break even, or living off of your investments, I think this year is, is a wake up call. Um, and, and just like uh, Ron mentioned, really the adaptation of virtual. I mean, we've, we've, uh, we've had to pivot quick. We had a board review prep course and it's a course that uh, like four to five day live course. And we basically moved that to virtual, kind of broke it up two hour sessions. Um, and, you know, surprisingly, we had 297 people registered before we went virtual. After we declared it going virtual, we had an additional 60 registrants. And the difference between satisfaction, minimal, if any. Right. The, the, the virtual atten attendees were just as happy as the physical attendees, and they have enduring content that they can go back and reflect on. So it has actually been uh, a great adjustment for us and, and really, uh, I think, helps us move, because we've always talked about it, right? We've always talked about online education, but really live has still been so uh, 
predominant, especially with our members. And now this has forced that change, it has forced people to kind of uh, step into the virtual environment. And they realize that, you know what, it actually can be done. I can actually walk away with more content. Um, and we're, we're seeing traffic on our, our learning management system increase. It has gone, it has increased 300%, 300%. And our self-exam sales are up 250%. So if you're embracing virtual, your members are too, because they frankly don't have a choice. And right. if the experience is positive, if you're doing a great job, I think this is something that you can continue. Yeah, Tino, you know, I totally agree. We, we have a board review course also, it's in August. And you know, for the last five years, we've had a, what we call board review on demand. And it's really, you know, if you weren't able to get there, we'll sell you the recordings. They were okay, you know, but it was, it was clearly a, a, a um, you know, it wasn't the most stellar product and it was because you couldn't get there. It was obvious it was because you couldn't get there. And the same thing, our virtual board review product is gonna have global legs uh, it's going to, the demand for it is going to be incredibly beyond the number of people who could fly to a nice resort for an eight day course. Um, and it's for, I don't know how you are at orthopedic surgeons, but for us, a third of the people that come to board review just love the immersive content. They're not actually sitting for their boards. A third of the people are first years who are sitting for their boards for the first time. And a third of them are doing the high stakes exam. Well, we are so excited about the virtual board review product because now that one third who are there because they love the content, that's going to be available globally. And it's not going to be a product that was sort of obviously because you couldn't get there. It's going to be, uh, we know we're going to sell more of it. We're going to sell it for longer and it's going to be a better experience. I do know we'll have a, an in-person board review meeting again in the future, but it won't be the focus of the value at all. And, and I think it opens the door wide open for international uh, participants as well. Whereas, uh, and before we've kind of, uh, you know, because it was a live course and because it was in Chicago, uh, not as easy to kind of get to. So, you know, can we now uh, tap into global markets uh, a little easier with this virtual content? So I see this as an extraordinarily positive aspect of what I would consider a horrible event with this pandemic. Yeah, that, I don't know how it is for you guys, but the part of the reason we've been able to make that double down on the virtual border view is that so many of the faculty, they have travel restrictions. So even if we could have the meeting of, you know, 2000 people for eight days, they can't get there to teach it. So they want, but they still want to be faculty. So they're yeah. saying, send me a mic kit, send me some headphones, send me my step-by-step. -step. I will break my session lecture down into three 20 minute segments so that it's more consumable in mobile. It's, so we are so thrilled at our, at our faculty's response to the virtual board review. Uh, whereas we were trying to figure out how do we convince them we need to do this. It's the opposite. They're saying, I want to be faculty, but I'm not allowed to travel. So thanks for helping yeah. me be recognized for my expertise. You know, that, that's a really great point. And I think even, even these cell phones now, the technology is just absolutely amazing. You know, you don't need expensive headsets and, a, and, a, and an HD camera and a, and a boom microphone and a person manning the camera behind you. I think you can do this very effectively with a stand and the audio quality is great. The video quality is fantastic. Uh, so it's, it's, you know, more effective, more efficient. Uh, so it's, it's working out. Yeah, it, it really is. Yeah, these are great points. Uh, and I really like the, um, the theme that um, the, this, this emergency that we went through, that we're going through, has given us permission to innovate in a way that we've never had permission before. Yeah. And these, these new forms of virtual uh, member services uh, that we had a toe in the water, well, now we're fully immersed. We're, we are fully baptized in that. And what we're finding is that it's actually providing more and greater member value. Mm -hmm. And it's doing it by, in a way that also increases the margins to associations because you're sort of getting rid of a lot of the infrastructure costs while maintaining, in many cases, the registration fees, et cetera. Uh, so uh, what has ha had everyone terrified a couple of months ago has actually, I think, been found to be um, something of a boon to organizations that are, that are nimble enough to make the pivot, right, and, and uh, resilient enough to bring the entire team uh, to uh, address the problem. 
Yep. Yeah, I think uh, to Dino's point earlier, you know, I may not have chest members globally. I might not have a board certified or board credentialed pulmonologist or critical care healthcare provider globally, but I do have people who are thirsty for the content we're putting out globally, and I'm going to be able to deliver, we're going to be able to deliver an incredibly high quality product because of the acceleration we've had to make to develop these digital on-demand products. And it's, it's really going to help us widen the tent in a way that's good for the treatment of lung disease uh, across the globe. Again, would never have wished for the pandemic to be the cause, but our response to that pandemic is going to pay dividends for uh, lung health advocates around the world. It's an incredibly uh, important point. So, you know, we're moving into this new normal, and um, I think we're saying goodbye to some of the traditions, traditional ways of doing business, perhaps. Um, what, what organizational traditions uh, will be, will professional societies be overthrowing, you think, uh, most thoroughly in, uh, in this, in, as we move into this new era? Uh, Dino, what's going to go by the wayside? You know what's going to go by the wayside, Kevin? Playing solitaire when you're working from home on a conference call. That's going to go by the wayside. Uh, it, it's funny, the, uh, the, since we've moved, the use of video has been profound. I mean, everyone's now connected. Uh, we're seeing each other face to face. And it's no longer it's like, uh, can we reschedule that meeting? I'm actually working from home that day. Uh, so I think we've all adapted to using the computer, getting on video, engaging better. So I actually feel a lot more comfortable w with everybody working from home uh, because I know they're on it. I can see them. I can see what they're doing. I can see what they're thinking. I can read their body language. And it, everybody has, a, has adopted the video uh, conferencing. Everybody has. It's awesome. Um, so I, I think that tradition of the need to be face-to-face uh, this, this, I'm working from home, let's not schedule a meeting thing is all gone. Uh, and I think you're seeing new levels of productivity from folks uh, because of it. Yeah. So that tradition's gone, Kevin. Yeah. I think we have to move solitaire. <laughs> I do. <laughs> and good, good riddance to it. Uh, Ron, uh, what do you think? Yeah, and I, I you know, the, for the people who are in the office, right, whatever that looks like, 10 people, whatever, for you know, masked or unmasked or whatever. There's lots of there's lots of different phases to reopening. But you know, before this happened, there was a clamor for us to set up uh, large panning cameras with uh, incredibly expensive drop from the ceiling mics in every conference room, <laughs> so that people who were remote could see the room, right? And so, thank God, I didn't spend any money on any of that, and. <laughs> When we come back, everyone will be like, just like the three of us are, uh, even if we're in a room full of eight people, socially and physically distanced nine feet apart, um, we won't have a camera over there that's looking at the room and seeing the side of my head as I'm looking, right? That we're all just gonna be like Dino said, we're all gonna be face to face and working together. And I'm not gonna spend money on incredibly expensive AV systems to film the room. I'm just gonna let everyone in the room and then that actually puts the remote workers on equal footing, right? Because it used to be if eight of us were in the room and three of you were at home, the three at home were sort of, or remote, were sort of uh, obviously bastard stepchildren. But now um, we're on equal footing because we're all one-on-one -on -one with our laptop camera. Uh, we're all one-on-one -on -one with our laptop microphone. And, and you know, the, the, and Teams has just really stepped up. I know Google's done the same thing, but you know, being able to kind of integrate that environment, the chat, the documents, uh, the streams of, of work has just been fantastic. So we've, that has accelerated as well. So now, not only are we engaging in meetings, but we're taking notes and we're posting them on the streams and these chats. And so now the, the stream of work and the thought is, is almost cataloged almost effortlessly mm -hmm. as part of that. Mm -hmm. We're actually editing documents together in real time. Uh, and you can see the changes. So, to to your point, like you're right, they were the they they were the the uh, odd people out. And now we're all on the same. Uh, we're all on equal footing. We're all seeing the same thing. We're all able to contribute equally on a meeting. And there's no there's no disparity because you're ones in in, in the office and ones. Uh, but I, I got to tell you, the the thing that I I will truly miss though are the drive bys. 
right? There's the, engaging with somebody online is so structured. It's so purposeful. I will meet with you at three o'clock and we will touch base versus the uh, walking down the hallway and bumping into somebody uh, and seeing how their families are doing it. So I, I actually, actually, uh, we have to come up with a solution for that. The, the, the drop-ins or the, the, the water cooler uh, yeah. hangouts or something. So uh, that, that I do miss, but I do, I do think that, that, that this working from home is, is uh, it's no longer um, this alternate uh, thing of work. It is actually mainstream now and it is part of what we're going to be doing moving forward. You know, the other thing that I think that's going to go away, and this probably isn't as sophisticated as an answer as you were looking for, Kevin, but uh, I, I really think the, the way people built up their workspaces at the office to be little shrines is going to go away, right? I don't know that we're going to move to formal hoteling where you open a drawer and take out, you know, but, but if you walk around the chest office, you know, there's some people who, you know, you can tell that for eight years they've lived in this space. And there's really no way that the building crew can even clean it because of the way it's set up, right? And so we're going to be deconstructing that so that the building team can be more efficient in cleaning, right? Just because that's the right thing to do. But also we need that workspace to be more flexible. It's not just going, even though it might be your desk, it can't be your shrine. And I, I think that's also a, a thing that people are going to have to get used to. Um, again, not moving to straight hoteling, but, but changing the way I think about my space at, at, at the office um, is that's going to go away. Ron, I, I, you've given me the idea. I'm going to change this background to the uh, I love me wall. It's going to be like certificates and diplomas. It's all going to be back here. You just zoom in on them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, great. Those are, those are great, great points, guys. Um, so going forward and um, you know, we want to keep this to about uh, 35 minutes or so. Um, and then we'll open it up for questions uh, from the from the uh, attendees. Uh, but going forward, uh, do you think members will have new expectations of their associations because of this experience? And and if so, what might those new expectations be, and what should we be preparing for? Ron, I'm going to ask yeah, you. Yeah. Uh, so um, first. And, and and Kevin, you know I love to wordsmith you, so. <laughs> uh, at Chest, it's it, the members are incredibly important, right? But our constituents, the global community that cares about healthcare uh, and lung healthcare, um, is th they already do have new expectations. We we hosted a, a webinar uh, live from Wuhan, China, with people who've been on the front lines of uh, the explosion. So this is probably two months ago, and the expectation of our global community was that we were simultaneously streaming that in WeChat. And that wasn't a nice to have. That was the way, uh, I think we had 26,000, I think that, yeah, that was the way 26,000 part people participated was a co-live stream in WeChat. Now, if you'd have told me a year ago, hey, Ron, we really gotta make sure that that uh, webinar is uh, available on WeChat to someone's mobile device, I would have said, there's no way I can afford to set that up. That's not a tool we use here, blah, blah, blah. I mean, I would have just had a million reasons why that wasn't gonna work. And the expectation of our constituents now, if we're gonna be talking about a global pandemic, we better be globally available to talk about it. And so um, I think those expectations are, are, already, are already here. That's great. That's a great, a great example. Um, Adina? Yeah, I, I, they have changed. I got to tell you, the when we when we pivoted away from the annual meeting and had to call the board, I mean, we've had several board meetings now, all virtual, and they're all looking at us going, we can do this more often. Uh, and that the, the need to kind of, you know, fly in 16 people uh, to have a meeting to conduct business is no longer necessary. Uh, I think it, it I think it's important from time to time to bring people together, it kind of uh, that, that kind of team building, that bonding. A piece that kind of goes along with it, but we don't have to wait till the sun and the moon and the stars align to get everybody on, on a call. Mm -hmm. uh, we just need internet and uh, some some computer equipment. So that's 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 all changing. The need to travel for education also going to be kind of going away, and I think it's it's about time. And I think that's going to be expected from our participants as well. You know, mm -hmm. they're they're going to be expecting more content online and things that they can go back and reflect on and pull back up. It's not 
you know, I went to a course and I took some notes and let me go see where I put those notes and uh, can I read my handwriting now? It's going to be available. They're going to be able to kind of access it. Um, and maybe even some of our old traditions around some of the things that we've set up in terms of our meetings throughout the year and, and why we've held them. You know, do we need to get together? Uh, do we need to get everybody together to, uh, you know, talk about state society issues or can we actually have that on a, you know, instead of bringing 400 people together, can we do 400 people in a, in a virtual meeting? Uh, and I think right. those are all changing. And so I'm, I'm actually happy to see that change. It, it, it means that we're connecting more often, we're exchanging ideas and thoughts more often, and we're getting more work done more often, right? It's not about when can we fly the committee meeting so we can make this important decision. It's how about we schedule it next week, see who's available, and let's get the ball rolling. Yep. Yeah, agreed. We do miss, point. We do miss the chance to have dinner, to walk to dinner, to walk back. You know, there are some things that we miss for sure. Kind of like you were saying, those uh, drop-ins, you know, checking in on you and how you doing on your family. But I do think the business of the organization, uh, we're going to be uh, more expeditious. It'll be less costly. It'll be, uh, it'll be, the decisions will be executed more quickly. We also have had two board meetings, two virtual board meetings since uh, the pandemic began. And uh, they've been great. I mean, uh, uh, they've been, they've just been great. Great. So my last question, and then I, I will leave some time for uh, attendees to, to weigh in. Um, if you had one, each of you had one piece of advice to give to CIOs, uh, to leadership individuals and other associations, based upon what you've learned, what you've experienced over the last couple of months, what would be the single biggest most important piece of advice that you'd provide them? Ron, let me, uh, let me yeah, pick on you. A lot of pressure on single, right? Um, there's just so many things I feel like I've learned. Um, uh, so I guess that's what I'll say is my biggest piece of advice. You know, find the dinos of the world to share those stubbed toes and bruised foreheads with, because we, we are, none of us are as smart as all of us. And, and I do think, you know, even though Dino and I geographically are only 13 miles apart in Chicagoland, you know, AOS is learning and experiencing things differently than, than Chest is. We're both committed to global audiences. We're both committed to healthcare, but you know, there are things that I can learn from him and his experiences, uh, you know, and so the, being connected to that cohort, even though it's, you know, I don't know how to say this differently. Um, I didn't always wait to ASAE Tech in December to meet smart people and share good ideas, but I'm sure more willing to do it more often now because I know it's not going to be about ASAE Tech in December. And so I think the, the one piece of advice is either connect with that cohort more often, or if you don't have a cohort, find it because um, we're, it's changing weekly and we're all learning from each other. Great point. Dino? Ron, that, that is fantastic. I, I like it. M mine's not going to be quite as eloquent as yours or as thoughtful as yours because I, I think as we have kind of run into all these issues, I think the one thing that uh, I, would, I would advocate for is to have a scenario planning framework. Um, and, and by that, I mean, we, we develop disaster, uh, re business continuity, disaster recovery kind of plans and documentation. It's all about how we keep people safe, how they, we keep the equipment running, how but it doesn't necessarily address how we adapt uh, our businesses to, to these evolving um, uh, things. I mean, we, we've adapted our business multiple times over. We annual meeting, our, our, our courses, our annual meeting for next year, and really looking at it. So what was really, really valuable was having a framework that we said, this is how we're going to organize our thoughts. These are the players that need to be involved. And this is how we're going to meet. This is how we're going to make decisions. And we basically have followed that playbook now three times. And all three times, I think it has uh, effectively yield us, yielded great results. It brought the right people to the table to make the right decisions on how to pivot and move. And again, it's not just about reacting in a crisis, but how you adapt your business and specifically some of your uh, individual business lines and, and products and services uh, to the environment. So I, 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 we can't plan for everything, right? There's going to be something else that's going to come from, from, I mean, I would have, we, we always theoretically talked about terrorist attacks, pandemics, earthquakes, floods. 
uh, and we've at a high level had insurance and we've had business continuity plans, but we've never had, and it's probably too hard to actually go through all the scenarios and come up with all these models, but it is feasible to have a framework that you can follow that, that can help you uh, uh, pivot and adapt uh, faster. No, Dino, you know, I, I completely agree. We're, we're, you're right at the foot of O'Hare, which has a lot more traffic than, but we're, we're right near Pawaukee Airport, the executive airport. And I would say it's more likely that a guy or gal practicing their takeoffs and landings at the executive airport is going to crash into my building <laughs> than a, a United guy or gal is going to crash into your building. But you're, you're so right. Our business continuity planning was all about either first person shooter or fire alarm or plane crash from Pawaukee. It was very structured around physical protection uh, for staff and safety, which are important things. But it was it was not um, it was not uh, about things like pandemic and how do staff deal with not being at the off, you know, just so many other things and, and adapting our business continuity framework to address things we haven't thought of has been uh, a valuable part of this last 11 weeks. And, and this was exactly where technology needs to be at, at, at the table each and every time when you're thinking about these different scenarios and how it impacts business. Yeah. Yep. That's great. I, and you know, it's, it's not only that planning, I guess, but it's also building a culture of resilience uh, and having a team that uh, is able to come together to, uh, to be creative uh, and to be nimble and to uh, pivot right um, when uh, the conditions warrant it. Uh, so uh, great. Well, let me ask if there are any questions from our attendees. That was a very nice comment, nice presentation, Joe, and thank you. I, I enjoyed uh, listening to what you had to say. I, I agree a lot with what you uh, brought up. I'm, I'm Dale Fajardo. I, should, I guess I should show myself here. Hold on. Let me, uh, maybe I can't. I don't know if I could show myself here. Let me do that right now. But anyway, hey, guys. So, yeah, no, I agree with you 100%. Um, we're, I'm at the American Academy of Ophthalmology, and a lot of what, what you're talking about is what we're going through as well. So, thank you. Yeah. Well, and Dale, you guys are at the leading edge of this in some ways because you've had an embraced uh, remote workforce as a part of AAO's culture for at least the 15 or 20 years I've known people at, at, at AAO, right? Yeah, I mean, I have, a, I have a team of about 30 or so people on my group and you know, about a, maybe a good number of them are remote, but it's still um, inside, the, inside the home office. We, we still try to have those drive-bys that you guys were talking about. But I tell you, it, 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 the mindset is changing. I, I've been pretty liberal about it compared to some of my other colleagues, to be frank. But I'd say that we're more open to these changes here that you know, solitaire on your computer, uh, no <laughs> way. But having to drive by Microsoft Teams meetings, um, it, well, not drive by, but you know, I could call any of my directors quickly or just anyone in the team. But it's really nice to have that, or you could chat very quickly. I mean, people were resistant to Teams. I'll tell you, people were, I mean, I was trying to promote teams pretty strongly, but after this stuff happened, COVID-19, people. It's on. And it's been great too, hasn't it? Yes, it has. No, I, I love it. I mean, Joe Carr, you know, Joe Carr, you know. I do. And he and I are buddies. Uh, he and I, you know, I'm the education guy. He's the IT guy. And, you know, when he brought teams out, I said, we got to, I told my teams, we, my, my folks, we have to take it. And there's, I got some resistance from people. I want to use Zoom instead of Teams. No. Let's use Teams first and use that as our internal uh, resource. And then if you want to use Zoom, use it for webinars and such. But until Teams gets the 49 people on the screen type thing, I mean, they have nine by um, three by three right now, nine people. So anyway, yeah. not yeah, talking yeah. too much. You know what? You no, know, no, you know, that's spot on. Yeah, I think you're, you're spot on. I think education in general, I think education, IT and guidelines in general, I think for healthcare associations are the teams that have had remote employees just because our commitment to getting the best person to be in place is not always location centric. And I think for teams like yours and mine, I hate to use the word vindicated, but in some ways our approach to hiring the best person possible despite zip code has been vindicated and people are seeing how you and Joe are able to manage your teams effectively remotely without them being on Beach Street, you know? So I, I think it's good. I'm taking some notes as we talk here because I do have one situation where I'm trying to, I'm trying, I'm debating with this individual, 
not with that individual, but debating whether we want to make them uh, virtual 100% or, you know, it's just, it's a challenge. I mean, I got a few good virtual folks, but there's some positions where I'm really hesitant about making them 100% virtual, if you know what I mean. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but yeah, that's a good point here. No, I like to hear what you guys are dealing with. It's very helpful for me from a benchmarking perspective. Great. Thank you, Dale. Uh, any other questions, comments? I think folks are beginning to hop off as we look at uh, four o'clock meetings and the end of the day on Friday uh, here on the East Coast anyway. So uh, let me let me thank Dino and uh, Ron, uh, Dale, and the other attendees for uh, uh, a very quick 40 minutes here that one's gone gone fast and it's been a great discussion. We're gonna be taping this, uh, it, we have been taping this or if tape's even the right word anymore. We've, no. been, recording, we've been recording this uh, in a digital format and we'll be making this digital format available uh, uh, after um, uh, soon on our website. But uh, thanks for sharing uh, your knowledge and your experience and uh, we'll, uh, we'll be talking soon. Hey, Kevin, this has been fun. Thank you for inviting me. Great to see you, uh, Ron and, and Dale. Pleasure to meet you. Good deal. Yeah. They had a joke for us. Thanks a lot, Kevin. It's a lot of fun. Looking forward to it. All right. Super. Have a great weekend, everyone. Take care. Thanks a lot.